So what we just did with the shofar is the 30-second explanation of what this chart is. Daniel 12, verse 4, the angel, the Melach, told Daniel to hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. This chart is proposing the concept that Daniel effectively hid the words and sealed the book by changing the letters from the paleo format of a font into this modern style font known as the Chaldean flame letters, thus effectively sealing the book. Unveil my eyes that I may perceive wonders from your Torah. That's the way it is rendered here in the Stone Stenoch edition. Unveil my eyes that I may perceive, show you, this is a tool, I'm now going to show you the application of using this tool to translate scripture, to decrypt the encrypted message. But if you look at the word that's spelled Nun Pe Lamed, those three letters, it's the word Nephil, where we get the word Nephilim. What if, it, what if each of the paleo, or the letters of Yahweh revealing himself were like these towers that have fallen because of Israel's corruption and betrayal and treachery. The towering giants, could they be the paleo letters? The letters of the Hebrew alphabet? The word Pelamid Aleph means wonderful, marvelous, secret, hidden mystery that's so amazingly wonderful. And it's pronounced Pele. And David said, will you please unveil my eyes that I can see the Torah. When you know what the letter means, and what's the difference between this letter changing into the next letter? Why is it in this chronological sequence? It tells you the aspect or the nature of the change when you're changing from this letter to that letter. When, once you realize all these letters, you realize, gosh, they have to fit this sequence. There's no other way around it. You could, you could take all the letters of the alphabet and throw them in a big pile, and then when you know what the letters mean, you'll, ha you'll, you'll place them right where they belong. On the bottom line, the bottom, of the, the, the bottom line of the whole matter, this is Daniel 12. Quite a lot of it's written in paleo, because once you get a handle on the paleo, the English words won't do. And this is Daniel 12 verses 4 to the end of the chapter. The reason these are down here is because there's a way of sequencing the, the matters in those three verses according to the pattern of the alphabet. Aleph is the plan that Abba purposed in his heart. Bet is the container of all he would impart. Gimel is the sent one to retrieve us home again, to enter through the door, the Dalit. Hey, look! He's the Vav, man. The Aleph Tavd accomplished and completed as he said the one word, Aleph Tav, et, the one word left untranslated, the one we all reject. Still the offer yet remains, Chaim et Olam, which is Yahweh commands the blessing, live forever. Chaim et Olam. For the simple Brit of love and death is Aleph Bet, his song, Hashir Shirim, the song of songs. If we know how to hear it, the song of love and death. The um, purpose of tonight's talk very specifically is to make the dictionary demystified. So this, this is the book. It's published by Carta, Jerusalem. And the word Carta actually is where you get the word cartography, which is actually map making. That actually plays into um, something else we'll hopefully get to later. But uh, the point is, there was one fellow uh, friend who bought one of these a few months ago, and he says, hey, look, I got one of these books. And I looked at it, and it's like, this is, you've never opened this. And he says, I don't know what to do with it. It's just, uh, I got a Hebrew dictionary, but I don't read Hebrew, and um, what am I supposed to do now? So the purpose of this evening is to say, many people in here have this dictionary, or maybe many people who will be uh, watching this, recording this video, 
And so it's like, I'd like to show people what I have been doing using this dictionary, and I have found this dictionary to be incredibly helpful. Now, it's not the total uh, source of the study that I've been doing, and the chart, which is out in the lobby there, which is um, shown on the previous video, is um, I would suggest that you use it in tandem with the dictionary, and I'll hopefully explain how that works. For, for the record, this DVD here that says Erectology is pointing at the chart, and this little four-minute promo that uh, you saw Jamie there is four minutes extracted from this DVD, which is four hours, and this is simply explaining the format of the chart. It's not explaining all the information, and as I say on this four-hour thing, which we recorded down here in Salem a couple months ago, is that the information which this is about was actually recorded at a couple home groups, one in 2006 and one in 2009, and the radio station uh, T2TN, Hebrew Nation Radio, 1220 AM down here in Salem, has reproduced those and made those available, which I believe we have a couple copies out here. But those each were eight hours long. And so they both pretty much cover the same information. So here's, here's the, the history, you might say, of this um, information. Probably 10 years ago or so, I came across Frank Seekin's book on the Hebrew word pictures. And do any people in this room, have you seen this? I see some hands just so I know how... Few, few people, not even half of the people. So just so I know who I'm um, speaking to, um, how many people have no idea about anything Hebrew? Well, probably half the people have no idea about anything Hebrew. Okay. Um, and besides that, who knows uh, who's going to be listening to this tape. So here's the thing. Frank Seekins is in Phoenix or Scottsdale, Arizona. And um, apparently, uh, probably about 15 years ago, he discovered something in the Hebrew letters. Um, I don't know exactly what the first letter that he discovered, but I know the most simplest one to render is the, the word ben is the word sun. B-E-N in English, ben, bet noon in Hebrew, it's the word sun. And the letter bet means a house, and the letter noon is to be living, or something that is alive that jumps out of its environment. And you could say, well, a son is one that is born, which brings life to the house, and when he grows up, he jumps out of the house and goes to make his own house. So there's this very simple picture in the Hebrew letters that bet noon is the word son, ben, and it means the life of the house that then jumps out and goes to make his own house. It's like, in a very simple way, Frank Seekin's book called Hebrew Word Pictures is, takes every letter of the Aleph Bet. In Hebrew, it's Aleph Bet, the first two letters. Alpha Beta is actually Greek, and then Alpha Bet is English. So I'll try to say Aleph Bet because what I found is that this is strange. This is a foreign language. You know, I'm a 21st century American Christian, and so what do I care about ancient Hebrew? Well, Part of the talk tonight is to show you the significance of ancient Hebrew. And what I found was, I have to retrain my mind, visually, auditorially. And so this banner here, which is on this little paper that we're handing out, and, and again, I apologize for the quality of that. It's zero, color Xerox, you know, and the, uh, the ones that we printed up before, um, we've already given those away, but those were much nicer rendered, and we would like to make those available to people, but this was the best we could do at the short notice with a short budget. But anyway, to get them printed up in full color and have them um, laminated was the way they were originally to be presented. Yeah, like here's one here, which, you know, well, she's written all over it, but... Uh, it's a nice little bookmarker. But the, but the point is, I have one of these I made in, a, in an aspect of one foot by three foot, and I have it above my door, and I'm always seeing it because I put it right above a prominent door. And then you could say, well, once in a while, you might sit there and stare at it and look at it, but to have it always in your visual eye, you could say, it's always working on your mind. And, and what I found is that these 
as Jamie said, these Hebrew letters are actually alive. And you could say, well, that's kind of a strange esoteric concept, but these are not just letters. These are not just scratchings of lines in the dirt. I believe, really, that these letters were designed by the creator of the universe before the creation. So this is not Christian, and this is not Jewish. That may seem strange, but we have been told, uh, linguists have said, well, cavemen were grunting, and then they were scratching and, you know, scratching, and everything became a meaning, and it, and it evolved into language, and it evolved into the thousands of languages we have now. I disagree. What I believe this is, what is on this eight hours worth of talk, which is then incorporated into the chart, which this DVD spends four hours explaining, which is about this, is that this alphabet, I believe, was designed by the Creator as the schedule, the to-do list, before making the universe, such that, that the seven-day sequence of creation in Genesis, or in Hebrew Bereshit chapter 1, is mapped by the Hebrew alphabetic letters. So if you have a to-do list or a plan, and you say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, you're going to build this building. Okay, where well, you're first going to find the plot of land. That's number one. Number two, you're going to excavate, dig a hole, pour some concrete. Number three, you're going to set up some framing. Then you're going to put the roof on, and you got this schedule. And finally, you, you paint it and throw down the carpeting, and you've got the whole list. That's what the seven days of creation are. And I found that it mapped to the Hebrew alphabet. And if the seven days of creation mapped to the Hebrew alphabet, well, which came first, the building or the plan? Sometimes you build first and you draw the plans later. But there's, in Leviticus 23, there's a list of seven festivals that Yahweh says to his people Israel, he said, these are my festivals. These are not Jewish holidays. Yahweh the Creator says, these are my festivals which I am now going to give to you to regard. You can say, well, wait a minute, Moshe, Moses, he didn't come up with these. David didn't dream these up. That was 500 years later. They weren't designed by Abraham. These were designed by the creator of the universe. They were his thoughts, his plans, his design. And he says, uh, who am I going to give these to? Um, Israel. Here, I'm going to give these to Israel through Moshe, through Moses. And again, I'm going to speak as many Hebrew words as I can not to confuse you or not to be Judaizing, but I was told by some people that says, you know, when you talk like that, we don't know what you're saying. The, the words are strange and foreign, and we don't recognize them. And it's like, well, if you don't say them, they'll continue to be strange and foreign. The more we say the words, the more familiar you'll, you'll become. And like having the words above the door, the more they bear on your mind, the more you'll start to so what, 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 they, they work on you, okay? So I'm going to speak the words, and by having these letters and have them on the hat is a matter of being in your consciousness, in your face, to, to work on you. So the point is, what I found about the seven festivals is that they are the same mapping, the same cartography, carta, there's that word, mapping, as the seven-day sequence of creation. <clears throat> and this is what the eight-hour videos talk about. And then what I found was the word mishkan, where we get the word shekinah, or the glory cloud, really means to neighbor, to dwell with, to come settle and rest in the vicinity of and to hang out together. The mishkan, the place where you hang out together, is the word for tabernacle. And the tabernacle that, that Yahweh told Moshe, you make this tabernacle just like the plan the paradigm, the model that I showed you on the mountain of the one in the heavens, you make the one on earth just like it. That that pattern, which I'm referring to as the Mishkan pattern, is the exact model pattern of the seven days of creation and the seven festivals. It happens to also map to the, seven, or the, the list of Beatitudes in the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament. That's a whole other matter. But the point is, these three things are purely of Yahweh. They're not human religion. They're not of human design. The sequence of the seven days, if he planned out those seven days and then put them into effect, then he had the plan of those seven days before the seven days, which means they came before the creation of the universe, 
which makes this the oldest archaeology of any, it's older than the stars. It's the oldest anywhere because it's the creator's to-do list off his desk, as it were. So here you have the pattern of the Mishkan mapping to the pattern of the seven days of creation, mapping just like two hands that look like, well, gee, those don't match, they're opposite. And it's like, oh, when you put them like this, they're exactly the same pattern. The seven days of creation, the seven festivals, and the Mishkan pattern are all the same. And what I then found in 2005 is that it maps to the Hebrew alphabet, if you know the meanings of the letters, according to Frank Seekin's study. So if you go on, for example, to ancienthebrew.org, I believe it is, which is Jeff Benner's study, he talks about the Paleo-Hebrew, and he incorporates some stuff from St. Seekins, but he won't tell you about this stuff that I found, nor will Frank Seekins, because I don't know anybody else who's found this stuff. Which is to say, if somebody disagrees, feel free to say so. But the problem with that is you have to understand this before you can disagree with me. So try to understand it, and if you can find fault, tell me where the fault is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over here to this chart for the sake of the camera, and I'm going to point this out. So because of you who don't know anything about this, if I go on about the dictionary right now, which I'd like to do without giving you a few minutes worth of telling you what I mean about this pattern sequencing, I'll have lost you. And then I'll say, well, go back and listen to the eight hours, and then listen to the four hours, and then go back and finish listening to this talk. I don't want to do that to you. I'm going to point out to you briefly what I mean. And then, we, you, you heard the first six letters of the song. The purpose of the song about the alphabet was to make it very simple. So if I tell you right now what all these letters mean, it'll be like, wow, this is... Because those of you who don't know Hebrew, or those of you who never heard of Frank Seekins, the letter A is simply the letter A. It's a tool by which you build words. Apple, you know, uh, architect, author... Most of the A words, interestingly enough, have to do with the one who's the responsible authority, there's that letter again, who makes something happen because of what the letter A means. Okay, so I'm going to point out to you the pattern, and then I'll sing to you the whole song instead of just the six letters, and then I'm going to show you uh, there's something we're going to run through on a PowerPoint, which Bill Sanford, who's in, I believe it's Mississippi, put together this PowerPoint revealing that, the, that each letter describes who the Messiah is. Now, wait a minute. This isn't the New Testament Messiah, Jesus Christ, because this is not Christian. This isn't necessarily the Messiah that the rabbinical Jews are expecting, because this isn't Jewish. What this is, is going back to the original meanings of the letters and realizing that the creator of the universe embedded in the meanings of the 22 letters from before the creation of the world, the identity of who the Mashiach, the Messiah, was going to be, but not the way we necessarily think of him. This might step outside of our paradigm of expectation. And I picture this kind of like, to use a little metaphor, it's kind of like Cinderella's slipper. The alphabet is kind of like Cinderella's slipper. And it's like, hey, here's this glass slipper. Whose foot does it fit? Let's take our favorite Christ figure, our favorite avatar, our favorite prophet, our favorite special holy man, and does his foot fit? I believe that these 22 letters describe who is the real sent one, planned and determined from before the creation of the world. And I just happen to believe that it fits the foot of Yeshua. Now the question is, if you see them in the Hebrew format, designed or explained by these 22 letters, does he fit any one of the various, there's like 20-something thousand denominations, copies of the English Bible? Everybody has a different aspect of who the Messiah is and what his doctrines and theologies are. I'm not here to step on any toes or to put anybody's beliefs down. I'm here to show you what's in the Hebrew alphabet. And then you can take what's in the Hebrew alphabet and compare it to your favorite doctrine, and if something doesn't fit, you can throw out which one you don't like. 
I happen to throw out the doctrines and hold on to the Hebrew alphabet because I think that the proof is the fact that the Mishkan pattern, the seven days of creation, and the seven festivals of yod heh vav the creator of the heavens and the earth, are the supreme plumb line. As a matter of fact, the very first word of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 happens to be the Hebrew word anoki, aleph, nun, kaf, yod. Those letters may not mean anything to you, but later on, hopefully, they will. Aleph is the, is the letter that means I will. Nun is to impart life to. Kaf is an open hand, which is a covering, which is also, I believe, represents the words of the Torah that are written like lines of script. And the letter Yod is my, which is a possessive. So you, could, so you could fit those things together, and that's just a little example of how to break down words that are spelled in Hebrew. But the word Anok is a, literally a plumb line. And you could say, well, where's the standard of truth? What's the standard of what's right? The true doctrine, the true principle, the true theology, the true identity of the Mashiach, the true rendering of any particular written script. Here's the plumb line. It, it, it's something you hold from the top when you're doing a building. If you want to try to find true plumb, you can hold up a uh, level. But, you know, sometimes the bubbles are off. But, but if you hold up the plumb line with a weight on the bottom, here's the plumb line. And the word anoki can be literally led as my plumb line. And I remember hearing someone say once, well, that's not my plumb line. You know, we have all been given the grace by the Almighty to choose to believe anything we want. You can believe anything you want. You can also be wrong. You can also kill anybody you want and pay the consequences because the, the commandment was, thou shalt not murder. And if you choose to, that was your choice. You will pay the consequences, but you can believe anything you want. You can do anything you want, but here's the plumb line. And so my particular regard is to say, having found this plumb line, now we can say, well, is it still valid? Is it true? Is it trustworthy? Those are all subsequent questions which we can deal with, but to simply present the information so that now we have something to look to and say, wow, if this is the true plumb line, I can take every one of my favorite customs and traditions and beliefs and habits and lifestyle and compare it to the plumb line and say, how does it measure up? Which I believe is the purpose of it. So here, I will show you the pattern briefly. And again, I don't want to take the eight hours that I took on the, those other DVDs, but this is just to bring you up to a certain speed of uh, recognition. As the basic pattern, it was, I'll, this is the Mishkan pattern down here, so I'll render this by the days of creation first. Well, I'll tell you what, let me show you the Mishkan first because these are drawn as pieces of the Mishkan. Here's the big white fence. Nobody was allowed into the big white fence if they were in contact with something dead. So outside the fence, in the darkness, they had to be first cleansed by the ashes of the red heifer. So the priests had to grow, develop a red heifer with no white hairs in it, kill it, burn it, take the ashes, mix them with water, and if you were in contact with something dead, they'd sprinkle this water on you, and you could say, well, is that a ritual cleansing, or is they making some kind of a soap out of lye and somehow cleansing you? It was the instruction. So to be cleansed with the ashes of the red heifer allowed you permission to enter. You'd enter the fence. Now, on the fence, there was one door. It was pretty wide. It had four colors of embroidery, technically three, blue, purple, red. And if, in the book of Leviticus, you'll see repeated more than 20 times. Every time it renders the color pattern, it's always blue, purple, red on white linen. Blue, purple, red, white linen. So that's why there's four colors. There's also some gold threads woven into the embroidery. But I was saying, is there some reason, blue, purple, red, white linen, blue, purple, red, white, blue, purple, red, white, what, what could this possibly mean? Hey, hey, there's four, blue, purple, red, white, yod hey vav hey. gee, there's four letters to his name, I wonder if the colors match. That's on the chart, that's another explanation, but yes, I believe that the colors sequence, blue, purple, red, white, matches yod hey vav hey. That information is on the eight-hour chart. I have to move on because we're really supposed to be talking about the dictionary, but I'm just letting you know that there's stuff there. There's buried treasure here. Having come into the big white fence, it says right inside the gate is the barbecue grill, the altar of sacrifice. Immediately right inside the gate, 
or this barbecue grill. Now, off in the distant, set apart place, inside of which were four items. But halfway between the set apart, in English it's called the holy place, it was a covered tent structure, halfway between the holy place and the barbecue grill was the laver. So that means that coming in the fence, the two items outside exposed to the elements were the barbecue grill, which is the altar of sacrifice, and the laver. Going into then the tent, the covered kadosh place, the set-apart place, the holy place, you'll find these three items, the menorah, the table of showbread, and the ark, the, uh, excuse me, the altar of incense. Then there was a veil, and in what's called the kadosh kodashim, or the most holy place, or the most set-apart place, you'll find simply the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to step outside of people's vision here. The Ark of the Covenant. When the Almighty was present in the camp of Israel, when he was present, when he was shekin, shekinah, when he was shekining, this is the mishkan, it's the same word, the place of his resting, abiding, dwelling with, neighborly with, you'll have the pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, which technically, a pillar of fire like it's blazing torch. Remember, there's two things that it says crossed through or passed through the two halves of Abraham's cutting of the sacrifices. Abraham cut the animals and the, set the birds up, split them apart, and it says two things came through. But the thing is, in Hebrew, when you get the letter Vav, which is a connector, it can mean two aspects of one thing. You can say, okay, it says a blazing torch and a billowing furnace moved through these split animals. And say, okay, these two things moved through. Who's that? Is that, the, is that an allegorical picture of the Father and the Son? You say, it might be one thing, one thing that both billowed as a furnace and blazed like a torch is another way to read it in the Hebrew rendering. <clears throat> it turns out that this letter kuf is our letter Q. And if something billows, it's almost like this question mark shape, this billowing, and with an exclamation point, bam, right off across the top of it, pointing the bullet point at the bottom of the question mark and exclamation point is what's at the bottom. Well, if you have this billowing smoke and this pillar of fire, boing, right over the Ark of the Covenant, it's pointing to what's in there. Any questions? Look here. And I'm saying this for a reason, which we'll get to in a few minutes. It's like this big question mark and exclamation point of any question you have in life is pointing right here to what's inside the Ark of the Covenant, which is the place of the Kadosh Kodeshim. Now, that's the Mishkan pattern. Now, here's the seven days of creation which relate to it. He started off as a status of darkness and said, let there be light. Boom! Like this big white fence. If you have this big white linen fence kind of backlit, as it were, like a lampshade with the pillar of fire, it glowing in the darkness of the wilderness. It's kind of a visual equivalent of, here's the darkness, let there be light. Here's the darkness of the wilderness, here's the big white fence. Can you, can you kind of see that mapping? The barbecue grate was, they brought a sacrifice in, the first thing they did, the priest started chopping it up and separating out the pieces. Put the blood here, put the skin there, put the dung over there, put the entrails over there, put the, the shanks of the pieces here. It's a matter of chopping it up and separating. There was a place for washing up. This was out. This, uh, excuse me, we're, we're talking about the uh, days of creation here. I jumped back into the miscom. Let there be light. The second day he separated water from water. It's a simple element of separation. The third day, again separation. See, every day was a, there's progressive stages of separation. He separated the light from the dark. He separated the water from the water. He separated the land from the water on day three. But then he also spoke life, plant life, into the soil. But if you look at Genesis chapter 2, it says, but nothing had sprouted yet because the rain had not come and there was no man to worked the soil, but there was a mist that went out, but nothing had sprouted yet. Bear that in mind. Bump into that later. That was day three. Day four, he put the sun, moon, and stars in the sky, in the place of the menorah. Day five, table of showbread, 
He put the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. Picture scales, balancing scales, like the earth in the middle, right? Tipping the scales, the fish go down and the birds go up. That's a picture to render later. Day six, altar of incense. Remember, our prayers are like incense. It has to do with communication. He made animals and he made man on day six. And then he set apart, and remember, the Kadosh Kodeshim, the most holy place behind the veil, is the separated place where no man could ever go. They weren't even allowed to look at the Ark of the Covenant. But the high priest, one day a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he was to go in, sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the Ark. And if he was unfit, the wrong guy, the wrong day, the wrong attitude, he died and was dragged out, it was a sacred place. The set-apart seventh day is the Shabbat, the seventh day. The word Shabbat means the place where you go back to, to rest, to return, to sit. So there the seven-day pattern look, fits the same basic schedule as the Mishkan. The seven festivals starts off the status quo being outside the fence. The Israelites were in bondage of slavery and misery and tribulation in Egypt, the tyrannical oppressors. Yahweh said, I'm going to be your Elohim. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to take you out of Egypt, and I will give you my ways instead of you having to conform of the ways of others who are imposing their ways upon you and oppressing you with them. I'm going to be your boss. I'm going to be your Elohim and you my people. That's like saying, let there be light. That's like saying, there's the darkness of the wilderness, and here's the place of safety, comfort, life, which is like the green pasture. Yeshua saying, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to my pasture. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the, I'm the pasture that will give you the place to be, that I will be the door protecting you from your adversaries. That's Pesach, Passover. Passover was on the evening of the 14th, immediately right after Passover. Like, right inside the gate of the Mishkan is Chag HaMatzot, which is the festival of unleavened bread, where we are supposed to, for a week, separate out the leaven. Separation again. Removing the leaven from your homes, from your cars, from your pockets of crumb. Any, any leavened bread, get rid of it. That's like looking through your life, coming into the kingdom and saying, what doesn't belong here? Outside the kingdom, in the darkness... You're doing whatever you're doing. You don't know the difference. You come just as you are to the place of the crucifixion where the Mashiach, Yeshua, bled like the ashes of the red heifer so that you can come into the kingdom of blue, purple, red, white, yod heh vav -Hey, come into his kingdom. But now what do you do? Now you separate out the Kadosh from the Halal, which is to say the sacred from the profane, which is to say the things which are... Kadosh, which is the pure, clean obligations and responsibilities of learning the ways of the kingdom of the Almighty and eliminating those things which are of death, those things which are soiled, those things which are common, those things which are not pertinent to being in the kingdom. That's where we learn the ways of the kingdom once we come in. So you could look at saying the concept of this salvation is to say, Yeshua said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to call them back to the pasturage of my kingdom. So because they were lost and wandering and oppressed by their neighbors and lost their way, come back and I will teach you of my ways. We need to be taught of his ways. And it's right inside the door of the kingdom. So the festival of unleavened bread is like the barbecue grate, separating out, learning the ways, chopping things up, splitting them apart, and then the next festival is Shavuot. It's called Pentecost, but the Greek word penta is 50, and cost is what does something cost? Count out. The word cost means count. Count 50. The word in Hebrew is Shavuot, which is weeks, and he says, you will count for yourselves seven weeks. Counting. Well, that's like a pregnancy. That's like a term of gestation, a term of incubation. It's like when he spoke the seeds into the earth where they were incubated in the soil until the time they would sprout. There's a picture there, which is why it maps to day three. So the festival of Shavuot is not just the first day 
and the 50th day being another festival, which is typically the way it's practiced. As a matter of fact, if you look at literally any rendering of this third festival I've ever looked at, they call it two festivals. They call it First Fruits and Bikarim, the first day and the last day. But if you look close at the instructions, it's one 50-day festival. And that's the key to this code, which I'm now expressing a contradiction to every other thing I've ever heard spoken about this festival. Just so you know, you won't find this validated by anybody else that I know of. The point is, it's a 50-day festival. I'll prove it by the letters, but just so you know, you will count for yourselves 49 days. The 50th day, the instruction says in Leviticus 23, you will have a set-apart gathering, do no work, you will rejoice. Well, what were the disciples doing in Jerusalem up until the day of Pentecost? They were hanging out in Jerusalem, counting just, oh, there's day one, here's day two. But if you, if you look what they were doing on the 50th day, they were recounting the wonderful things that Yahweh had done for them. They spent 50 days counting. Try it sometime. Celebrate this festival, the day right after Pesach, is day one. Think of one thing that you can praise and thank the Almighty for. Next day, think of two things. As a matter of fact, day one, the first letter is Aleph. Think of something like a concept of an Aleph. Day two is a bet. Think of something like the concept of a bet. Oops, you'll have to learn the alphabet to do that, but it's a good experiment. I tried it for a few years, and it's, it's worth doing. It's just to teach yourself. Okay, that's Shavuot. Those are the spring festivals. They're by themselves. Pesach, Haggad Matzot, and Shavuot. They're the spring festivals. Michael Rood did a great study on the spring feast compared to the fall feast. The first month of the year, the seventh month of the year. There's a natural break, just like the three pieces of the Mishkan that are exterior, the fence, the altar of sacrifice, and the laver, compared to those that are inside the tent. Inside the tent are the fall festivals, and the first three are Yom Teruah, which is the day of blowing of trumpets. Now, as a correlation, you take a menorah, which is a lampstand, you put oil in it, so you fill it with oil, and it produces the fruit of light. It's a lampstand. Similar correlation, a trumpet, a shofar. You fill it with breath, it produces the fruit of sound. So here's this correlation that I see, that Yom Teruah, the day of blowing, is like the menorah. It's in the position of the menorah. Yom Teruah. Yom, that's day one of month seven. Day ten of month seven is Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Pictures judgment day. That was the day, the high day of the year, the day of affliction. You're supposed to afflict yourself. The typical traditional way to do it is to fast. Don't sleep. Study the scriptures, do liturgy. The, the, the brother Yehuda does a number of different things. We who have no part, we've never regarded. We could look and say, how do you guys do that? But it's something to regard. The point is, we say, oh, we don't have to do that. It's like, it's something to regard. You might want to look into it. The point is, on that particular day, it pictures judgment day. Picture the scales. Fish in the sea, birds in the air. Judgment Day, heaven and hell. Judgment Day, blessing and cursing. It's a pictorial type. The table of showbread was a table, and there was like two stacks of six loaves. It's almost like the word table of showbread. Well, the word showbread is actually panim. The word pan is face in Hebrew. So it's like table of faces, table of loaves of bread. If you look in Hebrew, there's more correlations, but it kind of is like masks. On Judgment Day, all of our masks will be removed, and our true essence self will be weighed and measured, and we hope we will be found forgiven, meriting life and not judgment, which we believe by the blood of Yeshua, that's what we get. But these things bear some more looking into than we may have been used to hearing. That's day uh, festival of Yom Kippur. The next festival is Sukkot. Well, the Sukkot is where we get the word sukkah, which is temporary shacks, which is like everybody builds these temporary little thatched, stick-framed buildings that you live in for a week. That's the commandment. Oh, no, there's one more commandment. You will live in these things for a week, and the commandment in Hebrew is Ark Sameach. Sounds scary, doesn't it? It means you will only rejoice. 
Rejoice! That's the commandment. Oh, this big scary monster God is telling us to rejoice. He says, you will save up your tithe all year, and you will spend it at Sukkot for anything your heart desires. Alcohol, food, partying, that's the commandment to tithe on Sukkot. Store it up all year, and after the third year, instead of going to Jerusalem with your tithe, stay home and give it to the poor so that those around you and the Levites who have no inheritance in the land, they can rejoice with you where you live. That's the commandment for, for Sukkot. Are we doing it? Have we ever done it? It's a commandment. Leviticus 23. Check it out. The point is, the altar of incense. We've heard that our prayers are like incense, and it's like keeping his word is a sweet-smelling sweet savor to him. But see, here's the problem with this pattern. If you look at any rendering of the festivals, it ends with Sukkot, the seven-day festival. But wait a minute, that's only in the position of day six. What about the Sabbath day? What about day, day seven? What about the Ark of the Covenant? What about the, the following festival? Here's the problem. If you break Sav Shavuot into two festivals, Bikarim and Pentecost, the first day and the 50th day, you've run out of your seven because you've called that one two. But if Shavuot's only one festival that's 40 days, 49, 50 days long, gives you one more position open. If you look closely at Leviticus 23, he says the closing festival, you'll keep Sukkot for seven days. This closing festival is called Shemini Atzeret. Well, the word Shemini simply means eighth. It's also the root of the word Shemin, which is oil. It makes you wonder, hmm, what's this thing about the oil and the ten bridesmaids and when Yeshua comes back? But Atzeret is the gathering or the festival or the assembly. The final assembly, the eighth assembly, is actually the seventh festival. And if you read close, it's like, well, everybody forgets that one because they say, well, there's a seven-day festival, Sukkot, and Shemini Atzeret, oh, that's just the, the closing festival. It's like, it's a closing festival, and it wraps up the year, and it's as forgotten as the Shabbat has been forgotten for the last thousands of years by the typical pattern of our behavior. And the question is, well, wait a minute. This is, I'm not trying to cram doctrine down anybody's throat. We're, we're observing the pattern. And the reason I'm showing you this pattern is to say that Yahweh had everything just right. And if we miss the pattern, we've missed the pattern. And I'll show you how that plays into the Aleph bet. Here's the thing. Let's go to the big white fence. Tet, tet, yod. These letters mean nothing to you because you don't read the alphabet. Now remember, the point of this talk is to talk about the dictionary, which we'll do in a few minutes. But the first thing you need to do, if you're going to look at any dictionary, if you're going to look at an encyclopedia, if you're going to open any book, you've got to know how to read. If somebody says, oh, it's in alphabetical order, if you don't know alphabetical order and you open up an American dictionary, you will find nothing that you intend to find. Now, you can open up and start reading. In fact, I would encourage any one of you, get the dictionary, and if you don't read Hebrew, open it up and just start reading. You maybe don't know what you're reading, but if you become familiar with the way that words are defined, you'll start getting concepts, which are Hebraic concepts, keyed to certain words. And even if you don't know what the Hebrew letters are, literally, this is true, when I first got a Tanakh, what's a Tanakh? How many people do not know what a Tanakh is? A few hands. Well, I could point to mine. It's, it's a Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. If you get one, it, everything Jewish in Portland, there's probably places down here. But the point is in Salem, but the, but the point is this, it's got English on one side of the page and Hebrew on the other. And the modern Hebrew is written in such a way very similar to, this is a modern Hebrew writing up here. But one way of rendering modern Hebrew letters, which are called flame letters, flame, they're ethereal, they just kind of move around, they dance, you know, they, and they're almost like bugs, like ants, you know, bulbous parts and stringy parts, and they're crawling around on the page, it's like, gosh, I can't make any sense out of these things, they're very disturbing. So I just read the English, but there was some sentences, some verses I read in English that I knew because I've studied the Bible since a little kid. I've spent thousands of hours reading the Bible. And it's like, wait a minute, I don't recognize that verse, but I know I've read this verse many times, King James, NIV, American Standard. What? And I thought, you know, why is it that there's this vast discrepancy between what the Jews believe and the Christians believe? 
and you find a verse that it looks like it's completely from a different book, and it's like, what's going on here? Now, who do I believe? Well, the Christians got the truth. What's about them crazy Jews? And it's like, don't they know their own language? How can they write this verse so differently? And I go, wait a second. If they do know their own language, then what's up with these Christians? Are they lying to me? If there's a distinction, a discrepancy, who do I believe? Who do I call crazy? Who do I call a liar? And all they go, ah, I dare not. What do I do? This is what I felt. This was my personal predicament. And then I started looking for a dictionary. I couldn't find one. I found one by Reuben Alkali, which is a five-volume set. It has both Hebrew written to English, trans, English definition and English written to Hebrew. It's a very good dictionary. This one is the best one I've found. This one is an incredible dictionary, which is why we're telling people that, hey, you want to learn Hebrew? Check out this dictionary. The problem with this dictionary, it's written in modern Hebrew letters, and if you don't know the alphabet, you'll never find what you want to find. That's what I'm telling you. You look at a Tanakh, and it's written with these strange characters that you don't recognize. It'll do you no good, but you have to start somewhere. So what I'm trying to show you here, which, which is a just what I'm just going to do next, is show you what the Hebrew letters mean. Because I tell you, if you know what the Hebrew letters mean, how they're compared to the Mishkan and the seven days and the seven festivals, if, if the Hebrew alphabet clicks, you'll know it better than English. I still struggle. If I'm going to look something up in the phone book, it's like uh, elemental P, A, A, B, C, what? Run through, oh, that, uh, where's an I? Where's the J? It's like, what, what? But when you see the Hebrew, it's like, oh, JK. There is no letter J. It's a Yod. JKL. KL, coffin lamet, altar sacrifices. That's, that's in between the fence, which is the Chet, and the Memnun, which is the labor. That's water. I know right where it is. Boom, because I have a picture. It locks into the side of your brain. You've got right brain, left brain thinking. When you see the pictures, boom, it's there, and it's stuck. The benefit of the Mishkan is that it's a pictorial pattern. And I, and I want to show you this, and I'm saying this kind of slowly because I... <laughs> I am slow. Oh, man. <laughs> I, uh, it could be faster. Anyway. <laughs> okay, here. I'm going to show you what these letters mean, and then I'll sing you the song so you'll grasp it, and then we'll show you the PowerPoint to show you, this, you know, who Yeshua is in the alphabet. And the purpose of this is to try, I'll give three or four different attempts here, to lock the sequence of the alphabet into your mind as pictures, as concepts. Then we'll have to proceed showing you how to use the concepts. But I'm trying to labor this point because even after the eight hours and the four hours and the chart and everything else, people still have a struggle with it. So I'm just trying to say, I'll take this occasion to try to show you this picture. Aleph, our letter A, author, architect, artist, autonomous. It's the one who's the responsible party that he initiates and makes something happen, like the creator of the heavens and the earth. The letter Aleph in Hebrew is silent. We see this building, but I don't see or hear the author of this building, the architect of the building, it's inferred in what's here. The scriptures tell us that the glory of the Creator is manifest in His creation. But where's He? He has to be inferred. It's the silent letter. So Aleph speaks of the omnipotent, eternal Creator of the universe, the maker of all things, who reveals Himself in what He has made and disclosed, which is bet. Bet is where we get the word bone, which is the structure of the form of the building, another letter B, the word ben, which is sun, which is the manifestation of the life given to the house. House, bet, this letter B, the second letter is the letter bet, house. It's the structure which is, incorporates the form and the matter which the A architect, Aleph, designed and built, B. And Abba, Aleph, bet, is the strong, Aleph is strong, is the strong one of the bet, bet house building. The concept of A Abba, Aleph, Bet, A, B, is the center pole of an umbrella. 
The, se the center pole is that which supports the roof and holds it up. And either you are under the umbrella, in the shade, out of the sun, or in the dry space, out of the rain, you're either under it or you're not. So the meaning of bet is also in, or among, or with. So the letter bet used as a prefix means in, or with, or among, or through. It's the concepts of being contained or enveloped in the structure of what the Aleph provided. So right there is the Aleph compared to Bet concept, and the Abba, the father, is the responsible authority who is, is the responsible over the Bet house. That's very simple, but that's the rendering of Aleph Bet. Can you see those pictures? So, so then another way to read this is Aleph Bet is Abba, the father, I will Bet construct, materialize, make. So we think, oh, the creator of heavens and earth made the heavens and the earth. That's Aleph Bet. So that's pretty easy to remember. Gimel is the letter, and in the modern letter, it has a foot. It's the verb, the one with an action. It moves. And in the paleo is the head of a camel. It's a truck. It, it moves. It transports. The letter Bet, it's almost like an embryonic shape. It takes on the form of a, of a baby, a body, a a substance of a house. It's also, if you look at the floor plan of a tent from the top view, here you have the public side, the foyer, and here you have the private side, which is also, that, that private space was called my father's place, my father's house. So in any tent, in any house, you have the public entrance, and you have the private place around the corner. So these letters here, this is drawn like an ox head. You got the, the ears, you got the horns, you got the nose of the ox. The ox is a strong animal that you set in motion to plow a line. And what they would do in the farming communities, you put a mark down at the back end of where you want this furrow, and you put the yoke on the ox, you get behind it with the plowshare, and that ox would go right towards that mark. The significance of that is the aleph is a prefix meaning I will. So when you yoke up an ox, you say, this is my intention, this is what I'm doing, I'm going to go towards the mark. The meaning of the letter tav is the mark the goal, the destination, at the end. Aleph Tav, then, Aleph Tav can be read as the plan, the purpose, the thing set in motion, having reached its accomplishment. Now, just as another cryptic way to re regard, read Hebrew, there's a verse where Yahweh is speaking what he's going to do to Assyria, and he says, as I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it come about, so shall it arise. Do you see Aleph Tav? Aleph is the plan. The accomplishment of the plan is the Tav. There's another verse where Yahweh says, The word that came forth from my mouth will not return to me void. It will accomplish whatsoever I set it forth to do. That's Aleph Tav. In Ezekiel, 80 times, he says, Then they will know that I am yod heh vav -Heh, when this thing that I said is going to happen, happens, then they'll know that I'm Yahweh. How will they know? Because the thing that I said, Aleph, will certainly happen, Tav. And when it happens, you go, oh, oh, that must have been Yahweh. As a matter of fact, Yahweh says this other times. He says, if a prophet comes to you and he says something that doesn't happen, that guy was not from me. But even if the prophet comes and says something and he says something that does come true, and he tries to lead you astray, that guy was not from me. Because I will never change what I told you to do. Read Deuteronomy 6. It's a trick. If a prophet comes, gives a dream or vision, tells us to do something that happens, you go, oh, this must be from Yahweh, and he gives us a different gospel, a different teaching, leads us into a different way, he says, this is a trick. I wanted to see what you're going to do. And once I've seen what you're going to do and you hold to my word, your next obligation is to kill that prophet. It's like, yikes. This is serious business. The point is, when Yeshua said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, he wasn't speaking Greek. He was speaking Hebrew. How do I know? Because Hebrew comes from Yahweh from heaven. He was saying, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. 
I'm the one who said, I initiated this thing, and I'm going to end this thing. I was the plan, and I'm the accomplishment of the plan. Everything I said I was going to do, I will accomplish, or else it's not done yet. If it hasn't been done yet, it's because it's not done yet, and don't anybody think that the world is going to end before this all, all this stuff happens, because what he said in motion, Aleph, has to happen before it tovs. That's the pattern. That's Hebrew. So when you say, well, what's, what's this gimel, the letter with a foot? It means to voyage. It's a transport. It's, it's the one that goes from here to there. Well, now, I would maintain that the Aleph Bet describes the Mashiach, the Messiah. If, if it describes the Messiah, then when the Aleph says, I will, as a prefix, he's talking about himself. I will. Bet. I will incorporate into physical matter like the universe is made of. Right there, we can just draw a line between different theological camps because there are those who believe that the Creator would absolutely never make Himself into physical form and become a human being. What's the truth? Would He? Let me show you something about the word truth. It happens to be spelled Aleph, Mem, Tav. Aleph is the prefix meaning I will. But this middle letter means water. Mem, Mayim, literally is water. Remember how we said Mem was like the labor, a bowl of water. Noon is the, like the word sun, something that jumps out of the house. So the interesting correlation between Mem and Noon, Noon can also mean a fish, but a fish isn't part of the water. The fish grows in the water and then jumps out of the water. Just like a chicken grows in an egg and then jumps out of the egg. Just like the seed that was spoken on day three to be planted in the soil and then sprouts out of the soil. So the relationship between Mem and Nun is the environment and the other living creature within the environment that then jumps out of the environment like a sun jumps out of the house. But the, word, the letter Mem is a ball of water. But it's also like water, this wave, this turbulent, this chaotic action, like a tidal wave, if there's an earthquake over here and a shock, the shock goes underneath the water and you don't see it for a while, it grows, it incubates, it gestates, it gets bigger and bigger, like a chicken and an egg until all of a sudden you've got a tsunami over here, boom, that's the noon. You've got the 49 days of counting, boom, bickery, first fruit. 49 days of counting and all of a sudden, Pentecost jumps out and whoa, we got the harvest. There's the picture. It's a picture between Mem and Non, the counting, the gestation period. That's Shavuot, 49 days of counting. Aleph Mem. So all these letters, the Aleph becoming Tav is, in, is like pictured in the Mem. The Mem is a picture of everything in between the Aleph and the Tav. The plan, the intention, the initiation, and the accomplishment, Tav. So those are like these finite book covers, and all the pages in between are the Mem happening, the growing, the developing. But here's another interesting thing in deciphering Hebrew. The word spelled Aleph Mem is the word mother. You look it up in Klein's dictionary here and you'll see a list of definitions. It's also metropolis, which is a big city. It's also a nation or a people. It's, it's like an industrial center, like a factory. It's like the concept of, say, this is where things are made. This is where things are produced. This is where things are hatched out and developed until you end up with a product. You bring in the natural resources, you end up with a manufactured product in the Aleph Mem is everything in between. Mem Tav is actually the word for dead. Corpse. You look it up in the dictionary. Corpse. Well, wait a minute. You have a mother and a corpse. A dead mother. Is the truth something about a dead mother? That's what it looks like if you put them together. A dead mother, a corpse. But the other way to read this, Aleph is a prefix meaning I will. Mem be born in a womb, materialize to the planet of water in order to die. Well, gee, that kind of sounds like the Christian story of Yeshua. And that's the truth. Aleph Mem Tav, Emmet, the word truth. Here's the truth. I will materialize myself coming through a womb to die. Would the Creator do that? He's telling us the truth, He would. It's the plan from the very beginning. Now, who would deny that that's the truth? Who would deny that it sounds like the story of Yeshua? But it's not Christian, and it's not Jewish. 
It's going back to the plan from before the creation of the world, and it's right here in the Hebrew alphabet. Gimel is the one sent. Shiloh, where we get the word, the pool of Siloam, which comes from the word shalak, which is to send out, which was when you shalak a tabletop, you're spreading this stuff out. It's the sent one. Yeshua says, I am the one who came from the Father. I am the sent one. And he sent out his own. Gimel is the sent one, coming from. I am the one who was sent to Dalit. Dalit's number four. It's the door. He was sent as the door. He was sent to reveal the door. But the Dalit, the number four, also speaks of the earth. There's four quarters. North, south, east, and west is the sun, moon, I mean, the, um, the, the four seasons. You know, the, the fourness speaks of earth. Even though it's drawn as a triangle, we deal with that in the four hour tape. We won't get into it now. But the point is, he was sent to the earth to be revealed. Hey means to reveal. It's like a window. Open it up and let the sun shine in. The letter hey drawn like this is also still used on weather maps to show wind. It's a pushing of a direction. It's a Let's go like this. The word ruach is a word for spirit, but it's actually like the path of the wind. The word holy is kadosh. It's not, the, the angels, the malachim, are not around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. Sorry, that's not, no matter how beautiful it sounds to sing it, that's not what John heard them singing. They were singing, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. It's like, kadosh, that's, that doesn't even sound good to my ears. We've got to change our ears. We've got to change our ears. Because that's what the phonetic sound bite, the words, the vibrations that those melachim, those angels are singing were kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. What's kadosh? Kadosh, kuf, our letter Q, is a picture of pouring something out. We can get into that later. Hopefully we'll get there. Pouring something else in Dalit Sheen where we get the word douse like pouring out water. If you pour out clean water, that's kadosh as it were. So the word for holy is kadosh. The word ruach, his spirit, is also the prescribed path of the wind. Jeff Benner goes into this on his website of uh, ancient Hebrew. The prescribed path of the wind, like the jet stream, which is a, here's the pattern where the wind goes. If you take Aleph and mem it to Tav, and that's the truth, this is the prescribed path of Yahweh's plan, intention, purpose that he laid out from before the beginning until the accomplishment of such a time. And Yeshua said, not one little piece of what I wrote is going to be, the world will not end until every little piece of it's done. Not one jot or tittle will be removed until every single thing is accomplished. Well then, if, if this is what he ordained, that Aleph should become Tav through this process of memming, developing, growing, producing, in this prescribed order, then I would put to you that if you would know the meanings of these words in Hebrew, that this Aleph bet is the Ruach, the path, the prescribed blowing, the progression from here to there, HaKadesh. What? That's the Holy Spirit! Wah! Am I saying that the Holy Spirit is an alphabet? If you know what the letters mean, the alphabet embodies every single detail of what the Ruach HaKodesh will ever reveal, because he revealed himself in these 22 letters. Not 23, not 28, not 14. Yahweh did from before the creation of the world these 22 letters, and this is the path that the Ruach reveals. And when the Ruach Elohim, Merahephet al Pene Hamayim, hovered over the face of the waters, it was this vibrating. The word Merahephet is this vibrating, which is sound waves, shock waves, just these waves vibrating. There's something about these vibrations of his languages, his ways, which establishes everything. They say that matter is crystallized light, which is crystallized sound. Everything that exists, Yahweh's speaking. If you get into physics and astrophysics and quantum physics, the more you know string theory and all that, it all validates every bit of this that you can see from the Hebrew perspective. That's hey. Vav is the number six. It's inferred. It's never said Vav means man. Six is the number of man. Man was made on the sixth day. There's people who have done studies about how Vav correlates to six. If you stand here like this, and I say this for a reason, in Daniel 12, um, Daniel was told, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. That's an aleph, that's a concept. The angel, the malach, said to Aunt Daniel, here's your plan, here's your purpose, here's your agenda. A, agenda, aleph. Hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. That's the bet position. There's something in there because that's a container. It says, but I, Daniel, looked and I saw one on this side of the river and one on that side of the river. 
Okay, there's one on this side, and there's one on that side. There's one on this side, and there's one. See my head? It's gimbling. It's going back and forth. The word gimbal literally means back and forth. It's the letter with a foot. It means to go back and forth, like a truck on the highway, back and forth. It's like the long neck of a camel. You eat something, you... It's a conduit where things go back and forth, like electrical wire, like a pipe, like a throat. That's what gimbal means. And then Daniel said, but then I saw one above, above the waters of the river, dressed in white linen. Well, who's the one dressed in white linen? There's only white linen represents robes of righteousness. There's only one that's got to be the Mashiach. Did Daniel know that? Was that Jesus? I mean, who was that? It's the Mashiach. It's the one above the waters of the river clothed in white linen. So here I'm showing you, this is the very bottom of the chart. The very bottom line of the chart is Daniel chapter 12. Hide the words, Daniel. Seal the book till the time of the end. For many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. There's something in there we'd have to look at it later, which is another subject. I, Daniel, looked, and I saw one on this side of the river and one on that side of the river. That's gimbal position. It's doing, he's doing a gimbling. And then he saw one above the waters of the river clothed in white linen. I propose that's in the, Dan, uh, the Dalit position. And then he says, he didn't say hey, but hey means to reveal, to, to show, to like shine a light, or like open a window and, and point to something. He says, hey, how long till the end of these wonders? And then he saw, there's the Vav position now. He saw someone... And he, the, the, he saw the one clothed in white linen above the waters of the river holding his right hand and his left hand up to the heavens. That looks like the paleo letter Vav. Jump to the Zion, the next letter. It's a weapon. It means to cut something off. And it says, and he swore by him who lives forever. Stop right there. Who is the one who lives forever? You go to the book of Revelation. And Yeshua himself appeared to John and said, I am the one who was dead, and yet I live. I am he that lives forever. I was dead, and yet I live. The letter Zion is a weapon that kills. It cuts off. It's the, it, it's the seventh letter representing the Shabbat, the seventh day, the one that's cut off from the rest of the six. So in this sequence, you'll notice that the letter Zadi, the word Zadi means righteous, it lines up with uh, Kadosh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, representing the Ark of the Covenant, represents the Ten Debarim, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, which are uniquely separated, cut off, isolated from every other word in the Bible. These ten, these are special. The seventh day is cut off from the rest. Shemini Yatzaret is cut off from the rest. Yeshua is cut off and separated from the rest. The Zadi, he is the Zadi one. He is the righteous one. The word Zadi means righteousness. He's the only righteous one. He is cut off and separated, but yet he said we should all be conformed to his image. Hence in the song, in the position of the word Zadi, it says, Zadi stands alone, though all Israel shall become conformed to his image. My point is, this represents the Shabbat, but also number seven, the Zion represents the Shabbat, the seventh day, the weapon, that which cuts off. And what I'm showing you, too, is that this zadi is also a fish hook. That's a weapon if you're a fish. In the axe, it's also a plowshare. This letter Zion, shaped like an axe, another way of drawing it, looks like a, uh, a plowshare, two curved lines with a line in the middle, which are like these two discs that are pulled behind the plow, or they're two in the Leviticus scroll, you'll see on the chart, two lines with hooks on them, which are dragged across. You see, that weapon, the cross of crucifixion or the stake of crucifixion, was the weapon that the Vav man, behold the man slain. The Vav man was crucified by the weapon, but his back was sunk into with hooks and ripped open. His back was torn open with the plowshares of the Roman whips. The one who came as the door, to reveal the door, if you read it this way and that way, is the man who was slain outside the walls of Jerusalem. Chet is a wall, a fence. But he was also entombed. A fence is an enclosure. He was slain and then entombed. This letter, Tet, is a full basket. When something is full, complete, you seal it. It's a picture of a seal. It's a picture of also claiming ownership, like a branding iron, the letter Yod means my. It's the hand of the worker, the artist. So if you read Aleph, I will, and Yod means my, then this all says, this is what I'm going to do. This is my job. 
This is what the Creator is saying He's going to do. That's the way to read these letters. I will incorporate myself into physical matter, being born in a body, being sent to the earth, revealed as the man who would be slain outside the fence and then entombed, but yet it's by my hand that I do this. Because the yod means my, and it's a working hand. It's a hand that grabs a tool and goes to work. The letter kaf is an open hand. You can see the open hand pattern. And it, at the end of a word, it means you or yours. So the way to read this is, I'm going to come down to the earth that I've made, revealed as the man who was slain, and I'm going to be put to death, entombed, sealed, and I'm doing this of my own volition for you. Sounds like Christianity, but it's not. It's not even Judaism. This is the plan of the creator of the universe from before the creation of the world. The Lamed happens to be shaped like a shepherd's staff, letter L. It also speaks, it, the word Lamed is the word in Hebrew for teach and learn. Teach and learn. Teach and learn this stuff. But the letter Lamed also being a shepherd's staff is the symbol of authority. Yeshua said, I am the great shepherd. Who's the great shepherd? I am the great shepherd who came to do all this stuff. That's me. And if you teach and learn this stuff, I'll give you the authority. I will give you, Lamed, I will, I have the authority, will give you the authority of everything that you, is the, to teach and learn here to mem, bring forth as a promise, as a blessing, as a gestation of something that you're incubating, noon, the life that's been promised. When you plant a seed, you have an expectation. You have the expectation that the plant you planted by one seed will turn into an ear with a multiplied 30, 60, 90, 100 fold, 1,000 fold. He said, keep these words and it will produce to you life, blessing, peace, prosperity, happiness. If you break these words, if you don't keep these words, it will bring forth... <laughs> Read Deuteronomy 28. Has anybody not read Deuteronomy 28 lately? Check it out. There's the... Begins with the blessing, a little bit of blessing, and a whole bunch of curse. We have gotten the curse. It's time to get the blessing. And all, you, all we have to do is turn back to him. Turn back to him. Turn back to him who? Let's, let's turn back to our Savior. Who's our Savior? Our Savior is the one who came and said, I know there's some lost sheep that have lost their way, that have gotten confused, that have listened to bad stories, that don't know what's up and what's down, and where's what, who, what, who, what? I will be lifted up. I will lift myself up. I will be lifted up so that all those who see me will come back to me. Now the interesting thing, right after the letter of the noon is the letter Psalmic. Like the menorah, hence the color patterns. You see Mem Noon lining up with the laver. Mem Noon, Kof Lamed line up with the barbecue grill. Het Tet and Yod line up with the fence. Bob Zion lined up with the Shabbat, Sabbath day, with the crucifixion, with the man slain, with the red heifer sacrifice outside the gate. You see, this is in the realm of darkness. This is from the eternal perspective what Yahweh said he's coming to do, and this is the realm of the earth. And this white section here is Yeshua said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've come to bring you the life of the kingdom inside the het, inside the pasture, of my ways in this world of darkness. The heavenly perspective here on earth, and this is the coming kingdom. When he comes back, when we see the promises, actual our hopes, the hope that we have manifest. The psalmic like a menorah is an engineered structure. It's a prop. It's like a rose trellis. It's like a watchtower. It's something that you construct to hold something up. But so, it's, so, so, so Frank Seekins and Jeff Benner call it a prop, but also like a prop, like a propeller, it's an engineered device that works, that causes something to happen. So it's also a picture of a, Yeshua gave many parables about the good steward doing what he was supposed to be doing, doing what he was told, given responsibility and doing it. The sun is called the Shemesh in Hebrew. The Shemesh is also the word for servant, but not just any servant, not a lackadaisical servant. It's a servant which gets up and runs to do his job. Industrious, diligent, the, the good servant. That's the word Shemesh. The center of the menorah, 
The center candle is called the Shemesh candle, the servant candle. You light the center one, and you use that candle to light the other ones. Yeshua himself said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're not part of me, if you break those branches off, you can do nothing. Stay plugged into me. If we stay plugged into him, there is nothing that's impossible. There's more about that. But the point is, the menorah is an engineered structure. In Paleo-Hebrew, it virtually looks just like the Samic. Now, noon, remember, is the living one, the living one that jumps out of the mem. The mem is the environment of the water, like the chicken and the egg, like the fish in the water. And as you'll notice on this little picture right down here, let me grab this one. This is a noon on a somic. That's the living one on a structure. That's Yeshua on the crucifixion stake. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Now let me show you briefly, because we're talk, trying to talk about this dictionary. We're going to look up the word for noon psalmic. If you don't know the letters, you'll never find it. But see, that's what a letter noon looks like in modern Hebrew, and that's the letter psalmic, and you'll know they're about, this is halfway. Halfway is also actually here, so you've just passed halfway. So if you were to look up a noon psalmic in the dictionary, see, so you, you have to recognize the letters, that's the only way about it. Noon psalmic would be on page um, 418. And if you look at noon psalmic, right in the middle of the page, it says, a noon psalmic, remember, this is the living one on a structure lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, right? Standard ensign, flag, signal, sign, miracle, providential event, wonder. That's a noon psalmic. For Yeshua to be lifted up as the living one on the stake, on the cross, on the crucifix, it was a miracle, a wonder, a providential, a providential event means of the act of providence, the Almighty reaching down into the affairs of men and doing something incredible on their behalf of his volition. Yeshua on the cross is the sign, the symbol, the wonder, the, the providential of event that if I be lifted up, a psalmic is this structure, an engineered structure, which lifts something up, a noon on the psalmic. So if you read the word noon psalmic in Hebrew, it tells you what it is. And the collection of the other letters around it is actually what the word for chahal, assembly, the assembly of the letters, where we get the word ekklesia in Greek, or the word church, or circle, or circus, or it, there's more to it than this. And these words up here, they say aniyawa, the word ani means I am. But the word ani, you'll see in this dictionary, is also a, a fleet of ships, or like the admiral, or the emperor with his fleet around him. I, in my majesty. That's Ani, Yahweh. And all through the Old Testament, you'll see, I am Yahweh. In English, it just doesn't do it. Aleph, Nun, Yod. Aleph, the author, the one who starts it all. Nun imparts life and Yod by my hand. This is my doing. Let me, let me jump one other thing here. The word Zavot, we hear Yahweh of hosts or master of legions. If you look at it closely, it doesn't say Yahweh of hosts or master of legions. It says Yahweh Zavot, Zadi Bet Aleph Vav Tav. It's in Hebrew. Zadi Bet Aleph Vav Tav. You can say, well, read in the dictionary, any word that ends in a Vav Tav or a Yod Mem is masculine and feminine, plural. So what you have, if you look in the dictionary, is a Zadi Bet Aleph. Well, that happens to be an army. But it's also, a Zadi Bet is a turtle, and it's also a covered wagon. And you go, so is this Yahweh, who's the master of turtles? What has Yahweh got to do with covered wagons? Is he a pioneer? Or a... The reason I'm asking you these questions is because if you start reading this dictionary, this is one way to use the dictionary. Start thinking, wait, 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 why, why is he saying this? Another very interesting thing. If you look at the word for Aleph, Vav, Tav, it also is a sign and a symbol and a signal and, a, and, and an, it's pronounced oath, but the Tav can be pronounced as either an S, a T, or a TH. It's, it's where we get the word oath. 
It's something that you've sworn your word to. Aleph, Vav, Tav. Aleph, I will. Vav, make the connection. Tav, to Tav, I will connect my plan to that, and this is my oath. And if you read in the dictionary, you'll, you'll also see that the word Aleph, Vav, Tav is a letter of the alphabet. A letter of the alphabet. Every letter of the alphabet is Yahweh's personal oath to make the Aleph become Tav. But what's this business about Zadi Bet, which is an army or a legion? Well, what's the connection between a turtle and a covered wagon? It's something which inflates. It's something which fills up. Compare a lizard to a turtle. A turtle's got the big inflated, like a balloon. So you can look at every one of these letters and say, well, it's like a balloon. I don't know what they mean. They're just like a balloon laying there. It's like, what do you think that'll look like? Inflate it. You inflate these letters to their maximum potential as he originally designed it, and you'll see his oath of his miraculous wonder that he's sworn himself to. If we don't know these letters, we haven't got a clue what he said he'd do until we hear somebody tell us what he's going to do. And most of those people probably are lying if to, max, to fill up their own agenda, to control us, to dominate us, to ruin us, and to deceive us and lead us astray. The only way to know what Yahweh really said is to understand these letters. And the only way to understand these letters is to use his mechanism, which is the Hebrew, the seven days of creation, the Sabbath day, the festivals, and the Mishkan pattern. His stuff, by his design, not affected by human Thinking, condition, interpretation, or anything else. There's the seven days. There's the seven festivals. There's the Mishkan pattern. Think about it. What are we going to do? I'm trying to show you how to think. Real fast, we've got two minutes left. We'll get to this later, but what I'm trying to show you is that this lines up with the stuff inside the set-apart place, which is to say, this is the promise, blessing and cursing. This is the instructions, the Torah, and this is what happens as his followers, as his Talmudim, as his taught ones, as the one who have learned the instructions and believed the promises, this is where we live. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you a man what is good and what Yahweh requires of you. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your Elohim. In a nutshell, the psalmic, like the man, the good steward, do justly. The ayin, love mercy. It lines up with the beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for you will receive mercy. Be careful with the measure you use. It will be measured back to you. Pay, walking humbly with your Elohim, has to do with the fellowship of Sukkot. Sukkot is the time when he came to Sukkah with us. What do we have? 30 seconds? One minute. So the point is, the fall festivals represent our obligation that he entrusted us with as good stewards who have learned his ways. The Zadi is the hope set before us, which is to say the dead stick lives. Aaron's rod that buttered. Here's the proof that I will give you what I said I would give you. Moses said, how will I know that you're going to do what you said? The day you come back and stand at this mountain to worship me and you're free from Egypt like I told you, you will know that I am Yahweh, that I told you what would happen and it happened. And here you are standing at the mountain. I'm not giving you another sign. The sign is the Aleph is Tav. I told you you're going to come out. You're out. That's the sign. If we don't know his words and we don't keep his festivals, we've missed the sign that he's given us. I've, I put to you that all this speaks of Yeshua. That's more of a talk. We've got to get onto the dictionary. We're, we're out in a couple seconds. But the point is, these letters are Yeshua. These letters are the gospel. These letters are the Brit, the covenant of love and death. Keep these words. You, it's, it's his love. It's, it's our life. If we don't, we're dead. We're like we're not in the kingdom. We're in the darkness. We've got no hope. This is our hope. This is the hope set before us. This is the declaration, the revelation of the Father's face. Pane, face. Pay, nun, yod. Mouth, pay. It opens. Noon, the thing that jumps out, and yod goes to work. What is the thing that jumps out of the mouth and goes to work? His words. The word pane is the same as his words. You want to see his face? Regard his words. This is Yahweh's face. It's his words. It's in Hebrew. See how beautiful it is?